Thank you all for um, attending this seminar, the Center for Sustainable Tropical Fisheries and Aquaculture seminar series. And based on the um, subscriptions, there's actually quite a good attendance today. And they're not only viewers from Australia, but all over the world. We have United States, including Jap um, Hawaii, Japan, UK, Portugal, France, Switzerland, and Hong Kong, from what we could see. And for those who are not yet familiar with our center, our research focuses both on aquaculture and general aquatic systems that produce food, as well as the industries and communities that utilize them. So the center has a very strong applied focus and most of our research is based on collaborations between multidisciplinary researchers and the relevant industry and also the government. So I'm very happy to um, present Timothy Rovasi today. He's a <coughs> professor of marine science and a principal investigator of the Marine Climate Change Unit at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And he's also an adjunct professor of the University of California in San Diego and a visiting scientist at the Riken Institute in Japan. And um, his research interest lies on the current status of coral reef ecosystems, particularly his interest in looking at ecological relevant issues in the light of rapid environmental change, such as climate change. And he's using integrative approaches to seek to identify mechanisms responsible for the acclimation and adaptation of coral reef fish to um, rising ocean temperatures and acidification. Um, before I let Tim start, if you have any questions, just write them in the Q&A um, function at the bottom and we'll get to them at the end, but you can send them as we go if you have any. Okay, welcome Tim. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. I would like to thank Jen and uh, Roger to invite me here uh, to give this. Uh, this is my first ever Zoom seminar, so it's also a new experience for me. And I apologize in advance if I, you see me moving. I can just cannot give our seminar by standing uh, or sitting down on a chair. So you will see maybe the background changing. So today what I want to do is just give you a story uh, that uh, we start to look into probably uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, we will present some older data, but also some new data that's uh, recently published like this month and last month. So first of all, let me thank the people actually doing the job here. So uh, here is my new growing unit at OIST. Uh, I just recently moved uh, like uh, eight months ago. So most of the work I'm talking about today has been done by Tivu. You can see it here. And uh, probably you recognize Roger, that is also joined my unit by still in Australia due to the virus situation. Uh, all this work could not be possible if it was not for these two people on the left from JCU, you guys will know them, uh, Phil Mandy and Jennifer Donaldson, in particular the ability and the patient of Jenny in rearing the fish, and I will show you some example later on. That is fundamental for everything I will present here. Uh, also, this is a collaboration with uh, Celia Schuster for the University of Kong, uh, Moses from uh, Arbo University in the US, also, you probably recognize Heather, that she was at GCU until last year or two years ago, now the University of Alberta, and Kaos, my previous institution, with Robert. So, say that, let me introduce the problem. So, I promise I will not spend too much time about climate change. So, we know that we have this problem that is called climate change, and this is due to uh, anthropogenic enhancement of uh, the greenhouse effect. And that's what it calls is, uh, you know, prediction to be by the end of the century, if we keep being going with the current emission of the carbon dioxide, so ocean they will become warmer, up to three degrees Celsius, and uh, also acidic, as acidic, so ocean acidification. Today we focus only on ocean uh, temperature or ocean uh, global warming. So what I want to put down with these slides is, so right now, where you can see the hard or current uh, day, so right now uh, we really don't experience climate change. These are predictions in 100 years or so. So if you want to study the effect of climate change on any ecosystem, marine or terrestrial, so we need to simulate that in laboratory, uh, basically simulate the future, okay? Hopefully the future will be better, but let's say the worst case scenario. And that's what we've done here, or I will show you in a minute. So the other thing I want to point out in these slides is that uh, if you can see here, 
So the increasing of temperature, for example, it will be a gradual increase. So, and uh, of course, uh, you know, not necessarily immediately to three degrees Celsius, but will be a gradual increase. So that's a prediction, but the, actually the real problem that we have right now and is the present is the heat wave, marine heat wave. Uh, for those people in Australia that are very uh, familiar with this, uh, all the work that Terry Hughes did on the uh, bleaching of the coral reef in 2016 and also this year. So unfortunately, uh, if that was the future, you know, the classical concept of climate change, the heat wave are the present. So the increase in severity, in duration and frequency. And my opinion, I think frequency is the most important thing because if you heat wave, the keeping coming, for example, summer heat wave, every summer, so, and they have an effect on an ecosystem, let's say coral reef, so we don't have time, or the reef doesn't have time to recover if there is not enough uh, distance between heat waves. So, and I will come back to the heat waves at the end of the talk. So on top of that, or what I like to call the classical concept of uh, cl uh, climate change, so like ocean warming acidification by the end of the century, so we need to think about it that we also have other disturbances that they can add on on the already anthropogenic one. For example, we have tropic, na natural disturbances like tropical storm. Here in Okinawa, we have a lot of typhoon. And, uh, and we, you know, we know that this typhoon can actually have an impact on the coral reef here in Okinawa. And then we have uh, other disease, for example, coral disease and so forth. But also on top of the classical concept of climate change, we have, a, we have other anthropogenic influences. And uh, to my opinion, these are really actually more important or more strong in terms of how they impact the ecosystem than actually warming and acidification. For example, urbanization here in Okinawa, uh, basically they build an hotel every two days, a huge hotel on the reef, and the reef is a fringe reef, it's very close to the shore. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, and, and that's of course it will have an impact, for example, sedimentation on, uh, on the coral reef. Uh, I, I, Agriculture, also here in Okinawa, for example, there is a lot of agricultural farming actually close on the, on the shore, and that's created runoff of, uh, you know, pesticide and another uh, contaminant to the reef. And of course, one, you know, if people like me study fish, one of the most uh, or stronger impact, anthropogenic impact, is overfishing. And that's also here in Japan, as you may know, uh, fishing is very important food uh, in deep into the culture. So an overfishing is something that we are very uh, care about here. So all these disturbances, of course, they impact all the ecosystem, the entire planet Earth. But I think coral reefs are even more susceptible to this uh, uh, stress or why? Because if you can see here, coral reefs, they lie around the equator on the boundary of the 20 degrees isoform. So meaning that this system already adapted to an extreme environment, in particular if you consider temperature. So these are not used to in changing temperature much during a season or during here. So, Basically, if we increase the uh, temperature of the water, I think, or myself and other people think that uh, uh, coral reef will be the first ecosystem that uh, actually have an impact on this. So, for example, here a prediction of the fish, uh, number of species of fish, commercial fish, uh, so important. And you can see, uh, you know, projection during the Anthropogene. If you can see the bottom line, where you can see around the equator, where it become blue, that meaning that the number of species uh, of coral reef species, commercial coral reef species, is decreasing if we keep going with this kind of prediction. Okay, so this is becoming a very important socioeconomical uh, factor. It's not only to save the planet, but it can have implication into our society. For example, in Japan here, uh, and that is true figure, so Japan is almost 40 billion dollar, US dollar here, or commercial fishing, including farming. Imagine if we deploy all the fish population, so they will also have consequences on the society, but people losing job, economy, crashing, and so forth. Uh, another important aspect of coral reef is the tourism. 
uh, as you know, in the GBR in Australia, where most of you guys are now, uh, is uh, almost uh, five to six billion dollars a year of tourism. Here in Okinawa is a huge business uh, tourism, you know, go to Sinimo and so forth. So the point is, is also climate change may have very profound social economic implications. So because of this, a uh, few years ago, uh, with Phil and Jenny and other TV and other, we sit down and say, okay, we need to create a future environment, right? Because we don't experience right now, we cannot measure right now the real climate change, except for the heat wave. So, and we ask just a simple question. What happened to fish, coral reef fish in our cases, uh, in a near future climate? For example, in higher water temperature, or lower pH or high salinity and so forth. Today we focus on the temperature, but also we did a lot of work on the pH and the salinity. And um, so what are the possible scenarios when we, you know, when we start this exercise? Well, you know, climate change will deplete all the fish. That's the worst case scenario. Fish population that can migrate, uh, that is okay, but it's not a very good idea because uh, that will, uh, as you know, probably understand, it will shift the ecosystem. And again, that is not a good idea. Or maybe fish population that will acclimatize or adapt to the new environment, especially if you give some times by the end of the century. So how we test this hypothesis or, or answer this question? Well, we set up what we call a laboratory um, set up for uh, future climate. So, and that is the simple idea. So we went to the wild in, uh, the, for example, the Great Barrier Reef. We collect a wild caught pear, so breeding pear. We bring it back to the aquaria. We let it acclimatize for a few months in the new environment. And then we start to play around with the condition. So increasing temperature, decreasing pH. And then we observe what happened to the fish by measuring a certain number of phenotypes, of phenotypic traits. And because we are also interested in understanding the molecular mechanism of uh, this response of the, of the fish to uh, climate stress, so we then come into with uh, a lot of different genomic techniques, and I will explain you in a second, in order to understand how the genome is shaped, or, or the epigenome is shaped by this stressor. But the important thing is we do this across generation. Why? Well, that is very important because if climate change is really happened by the end of the century, you know, that's a core through generation, right? We'll not be tomorrow we wake up and the temperature is three degrees. So fish that will reproduce in different increasing temperatures. So we need to understand what's going on here. So we are lucky enough to use very complicated and sophisticated aquaria. For example, a lot of the study I present today has been done in Ames in Townsville uh, with the sea simulator or the GCU aquaculture facility. And now here in Okinawa at the uh, OIS Marine Science Station. So uh, we've done that for different species now. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, today, most of the work is done in Nepali, that is the denser fish, the one on the left. But also we have data, similar data uh, on uh, the Nemo, the Percola, and other uh, anemone fish. So, uh, okay, so Jenny, a few years ago, set up this very elegant and simple to me uh, experiment designed uh, in Epoli. So what we do, we did is go to the wild, get collect the breeding pairs, that's the F0, let it breed in Aquaria, GCU, and then we split the clouds, the F1, so the baby fish, right? So in current day temperature, so normal temperature for the GBR is around 28.5 average uh, degrees Celsius, or increasing 1.5 mid-century and three degree end of the century, based on the prediction. And then we measure the phenotype. So we notice, first of all, that the fish are still able to breed. So then we have the F2, and we do the same thing. The F2, we split it again, current day, plus 1.5 and three. And that is very important for the rest of the talk. So, if now, if you look at the F2, we can call fish developmental. So are those fish that the parents, the born in normal condition, normal uh, current day temperature, but soon they hatch, the baby fish, they're split in higher temperature, okay? Developmental because these fish, they will develop in higher temperature, but the parents, they did not. The transgeneration, another end, the right side here, are those fish that the parents somehow already experience the, pre, uh, the new condition or the new environment, either 1.5 degree or three degrees. So basically, 
the transgeneration are, are those fish that are coming from developmental fish in thermal treatment. So here is what surprisingly amazing result for me for Jenny and Phil is, you know, we noticed that the fish in higher temperature, they have a metabolic phenotype. So the aerobic scope decreased. And you can see here, we know climation. So, uh, you know, fish that they never experience the new environment or the developmental here. So the fish that they born and uh, so soon they hatch, they've been throwing out water, they still have a decrease in aerobic scope. So the, uh, the green and the red bar, right? Compared to the normal temperature, that is the blue bar. So the, the, the current temperature. But we'll let, looks what happens if your parents, they spend the entire life at higher temperature. So there is an amazing and fast, uh, basically restoration of the scope and also almost overcompensation. So meaning that the experience that your parents have during their life in terms of new environment is actually somehow transmitted to the next generation. And that we call a transgenerational transfer of phenotype or transgenerational plasticity. So that was a pretty amazing result to me. So now, so how they do that? So what are the molecular basis of this transfer? So why did the, you know, the F2 generation is born already adapted, if you like, uh, to this new environment? So then we come into with uh, some genomic techniques. So using the same experiment design here that uh, Jen and Phil, they used a long time ago. So what we did is just select the liver because of the metabolic phenotype was a kind of educated guess. And we start to study the transcriptome of the liver using uh, Illumina sequencing. So the transcriptome basically is the collection of all the expressed transcript and any given time in the fish. And now to squish, that is TiVo paper, to squish a lot of work in one slide, that's what TiVo and Eder found. So if you look on the left side here, this is a dendrogram. So it's a differential express set of gene. So where is red meaning highly expressed, white mean low express or not differential express. And you can see now the label didn't come out here, but the last two columns, these two, these are the transgenerational uh, fish. So the one that's are transgenerational adapted compared to the control of the developmental. So what we found here is a set of pathway, which you can see which one are here on the right side, that uh, they tend to be upregulated only in those fish that are transgenerationally adapted or climatized. And this gene, like everyone study genomics, say, okay, this makes sense. Well, they do make sense because they're involved in metabolism, stress, and immune response. So all the pathways that you expect to be upregulated in order to compensate the reduction on the scope. That was also pretty cool, I think, in terms of result. Now, that was the first type of experiment we done. Okay, and uh, so what we learn is that fish they adapt in one generation or they acclimatize in one generation, and they do it by compensating a specific pathway in the liver related to metabolism. But again, putting back these slides, I want to state the point. So not only current day here, but also, as I told you, so the temperature will increase gradually by the end of the century, not immediately to three degrees. So Moses and Jenny, they, they set up another type of experiment to, to see if actually is, is you know, to, to mimic even more the reality here, right, in laboratory. So what they did, they had another uh, uh, treatment, and it's here with the hard row, it's called STEP. So this is a transgenerational STEP treatment. What does it mean? That's the parents, now they're 1.5, okay, throughout the life. So like similar to the 1.5 transgeneration, but the baby, now they're put in three degrees. So like, basically try to recapitulate what will be the gradual increase of uh, uh, the temperature by the end of the century. We call that step because, you know, there's a step increase in temperature. Why we did that? Well, we asked the question. We know that the fish, they acclimatize if the parents, they develop a, a certain temperature. But even, they also acclimatize uh, if the parent experiences less temperature or a, a moderate increase in temperature? So the answer is yes. Here, uh, you can see here the control on the left side in blue, and uh, that is the scope. And then you can see here the classical transgeneration of plus 1.5 or three degree, and here the step. So meaning that even if the parent experiences moderate increase in temperature, the next generation is still able to cope with that 
higher increase of temperature. So this is kind of good news, if you say, because it's more similar to, to what will happen, right, by the end of the century. So how they do that, of course, we did the same genomic approach. So we uh, sequenced the transcriptome. And surprisingly, so uh, they still adapt, but they use different type of pathway compared to the classical transgenerational uh, acclimatization I showed you before. Okay, so uh, pathways that are more involved in uh, oxygen uh, metabolism, like mitochondria, and so forth. The, so basically, they get to the same point by using different ways. So that's the point. And that was, I think, a very important result here. Now, this experiment they become very complicated because now we reach the F3, and here is just to give you an example of how this experiment can be complicated in terms of number of fish. So we just finished to analyze and write the paper for the F3. I cannot show you the result here. We will submit it this week. But with the F3, we were able to do also, so basically the grandparents, the grandchild, sorry. So uh, all those fish are just presented now. So we can do funky things. So taking those acclimatized to a certain temperature, put it back at normal temperature and asking if it's still able to acclimatize and so forth. So stay tuned, the result will come up hopefully soon. So the paper is ready. So now, that's what we learned so far, right? Now, how, the question that for me was more important of all is, how the parent transfer the information to the next generation. So there must be something happening in the eggs, in the sperm, or during the development of the parents that they say, hey, listen, if you really want to survive or perform better in the new environment, you need to turn on or turn off this set of genes. Okay? So, but mechanistically, how this happen? Well, we thought about it, could be Darwinian selection, eh, unlucky, because, uh, you know, it's very slow, and that is one generation. And this fish, one generation is six months, nine months, right? So it cannot be selection. So then we turn on uh, another concept that I don't know if you guys are familiar, is, is the concept of epigenetic. This is the definition of epigenetic uh, from Wikipedia. It, uh, epigenetic is the study of a readable phenotype without the change of the DNA sequence. So it's not Darwinian selection, it's no mutation, it's chemical modification of the genome that's are reversible, but they can be transferred to the next generation or during cell, uh, cell cycle division. And there are several of these epigenetic marks, for example, non-coding RNA, uh, histone modification, but the one that we decided to look into better was methylation of the DNA. So the, I will come back to this in a second. But before we do that, so we did our research, right? So say, it's already been shown that epigenetic, all the environment can change the epigenome of, uh, of any animals, for example. Well, lucky enough, there was a lot of work done in model organisms, such human, and this is a beautiful uh, example of how the environment, that's a paper in science from the UK consortium, how the environment can shape the epigenome. These are monozygotic twin, right, that for some different reason, war and other reason, they've been separated at birth. So these people in UK, what they did, they find this twin, the sequence the genome, they should verify the genome is the same, but as you can see here, the phenotype, phenotype is different. Normally when you're, you see monozygotic twin uh, brought up at the same household, they look identical, right? Here, they don't look, some of them, they don't even look uh, uh, like brother or sister. So this is a very elegant proof that the environment, in this case, where these people, you know, they, socioeconomical status of the parents and so forth, the adopting parents, uh, can change the phenotype even if you have the same genome. So, because we got excited of this, what we did is, okay, let's go to measure the methylation partner of uh, our fish and see if actually can correlate it with this uh, acclimation we see. So, just briefly, what is DNA methylation does? This is a super oversimplification, so I apologize if someone is an expert of this, but just to give you an idea, so people, in, again, in model organisms like human and mouse show that we have a gene, right, and the gene is on. Uh, normally around the gene, you have a region promote, that's called promoter, which transcription factor, which are protein, bind the promoter and drive the expression of the gene. A lot in, in in vertebrate, a lot of these uh, uh, promoted, they have a lot of CPG islands, so a region re, re, uh, rich of CPG, right? And the methylation occurs on the cytosine, right? So the idea here is 
if you see the CPG island here represented by this dot, if they're not methylated, so now what happens? The transcription factor can bind the promoter and drive the expression of the gene. But if you start to methylate on the right side here with the hem, so now you create a sterical uh, impairment. So basically, the transcription factor physically cannot bind the promoter, and therefore the gene cannot be expressed. Okay, that is an oversimplification. Then there is also non coding RNA involving this, but just to give you an idea. So using the same experiment design, right? Uh, you know, the transgeneration F2 in higher temperature. So Tivo and Herder and Jenny, what they did is uh, sequence what we call the methylome of uh, this fish in the liver. The same fish will measure the transcriptome. So what is the methylome? So basically it's a technique that allows you to measure the entire methylation pattern in uh, genome wide. And of course, for do that, and to map these methylation differences, you need to have a genome. So and Tivo and Roger, uh, Robert, they really sequence a very nice genome we presented at the end of the A poly in order to use as, as a tool to map the methylome. So, but what are the results of this methylome? Well, here is very cool. Now, on the left side here, what we see, each dot is a fish, and this is a uh, dimensional reduction where it shows the difference in the methylome. And you can see here in the uh, red circle, where in, in yellow, these are the transgenerational fish. And you can see, and, and the other one, that the control of the development. And you can see here, only the transgenerational fish, they tend to have a very, very similar specific methylome, which is totally different than the uh, one of the control. And on the right side is the same data. Now, each, now it's a dendrogram. Each line here is a differential methylated region. So dark blue meaning, highly methylated, light blue or white mean low methylated. But you can see here, the transgeneration in red, are they have a particular specific barcode in terms of gene, uh, epigenome that is totally different than the one that's of the control and the step or uh, the developmental, which tend to be very similar. So this was the first proof that uh, selective DNA, I think there is 180 of these genes, so TIVO identified, or this low site that are differential methylated. And uh, so they are specific for the transgeneration. So that is the first link to show that the environment can shape the genome, or the epigenome in this case, of the next generation, and this can be transferred. Okay, so now probably you're asking, which gene are these? Well, again, when you are a genomicist, you say, it all makes sense. And again, here is the common part. So those genes that are differentially methylated only in the transgenerational are genes that are involved, again, in oxygen production, agiogenesis, and, and so forth. So all those pathways that you need to increase the metabolic rate. OK? And that is also published. So basically, to conclude this part of the talk, so what we show that fish can acclimate to higher water temperature in one generation by metabolic compensation due to differential expression of specific pathway in the liver. And the parents that are able to transfer the information of the new environment to the next generation by selective DNA methylation of specific loci. Okay, so that was pretty cool. But now, climate change has different effect on, on fish population. So we, we can have an effect on time, and that's what just is explain to you. So we, we can have an acute response, you can have a developmental response uh, through time, so, and I show some data, or multi-generational response, like the transgenerational fish. But also in space, because we know that, uh, you know, there is a fish population, even the same species, can be adapted to different longitudinal gradient in temperature, naturally, and therefore maybe there is some kind of local adaptation that can influence what we saw here in terms of uh, uh, fast transgenerational acclimation. So we tested that. How? Well, in two ways. So first of all, Eder and Tivo, they went to uh, Chu Island in, uh, in the GBR, Palm Island and the north, uh, sorry, yeah, and the north and Aeron Island at uh, uh, the south. The Aeron Island fish are the one I just uh, described here. And the, the same species for poi, so they collect fish and they measure the transcriptome in the same context of higher water temperature. And surprisingly, what they found is that, yes, even if it's the same species, even if it's the same coral reef system, where you're coming from is important. So your 
history or, how, or temperature history uh, or adaptation that you experience in the specific population can change the way that you respond to higher temperature. So for example, the uh, heronana fish on the bottom, they tend to differentially express way more gene than the uh, northmost uh, palm island, which are not actually used to in, in a lot of water, temp uh, water change compared to the heronana fish. So then we went further. So we asked, okay, what about acclimation uh, and, and the epigenomes, all right? So here is another experiment, this is recently published, uh, another experiment that Thibaut did uh, together with Jenny and Heather. So now we have the two islands. The Palm Island are the one I just described you, right? With the 180 differential uh, methylated region that are involved in uh, increased oxygen production and so forth. And then we have the Aeron Island. The Aeron Island, we don't see that uh, transgenation acclimation, but they tend to acclimate, acclimatize during uh, developmentally. So we call within generation plasticity because it's within one generation and non transgenerational plasticity. So that's what Jen and Tivo show here is some of the data. So you can see the Aaron Allen fish that they keep in mind are the one used to, uh, you know, during the season to have a more different, uh, like different temperature compared to the Palm Island that they need to be more stable throughout the year. So the Palm Island fish the non acclimatized So, what about the epigenome? So we did the same exercise, right? So we went to uh, take the liver, sequence the, uh, the genome and the epigenome. And what you can see here on the top, so don't for, forget about the bottom, that is a control that we have in order to show that uh, the clustering is not random. But if you see the CPG island on the top, again, each dot is a fish and uh, different treatment. You can see again that there is specific Met, uh, differential methylation that is correlated with this within generational plasticity. So basically, we have two types of plasticity, within generational and transgenerational. Both they are basically, for our opinion, uh, uh, driven by this differential methylation, but yet again of different uh, pathway. Again, this is the same thing that uh, Ed showed with the transcriptome. So fish they tend to acclimatize uh, to get to the same end point but using different molecular torques. And here again, this common part where they come out is heart rate uh, regulation, blood pressure and so forth. Uh, but there is also some commonality or how these two population or, or locally adapted fish, uh, they uh, tend to uh, acclimatize a higher temperature. For example, regulation of blood pressure metabolism and cell volume seem to be always important and necessary to have this plasticity, even you know, in a different type of local adapted population. Now, so that was a nice story, okay? So now we start to look also, not only one population, we also start to implement in this work um, questions such as, is the local adaptation is important? What happened to different population of fish, you know, if you go a longitudinal gradient? But as I told you earlier at the beginning, the real problem now is not the future prediction of climate change, but it are the heat wave. That's what's happening now. This is the present. So um, we were lucky enough uh, to, you know, to, again, collaborate with people at GCU and Terry, and we were lucky enough to uh, be able to sample different species of fish during uh, no, before, during, and two time point after the famous uh, El Nino driven uh, 2016 marine heat wave that bleached the coral reef. So, you know, very huge natural paper and so forth. So uh, we were able to sample here. You can see that is the sampling site. That is the species. So Denzel fish and Apagonis. And here is the sampling time. So you can see in pink here, that is the heat wave. And that is our sampling time. So why we did that? Well, because all our experiments, they show acclimation and they show a response to higher temperature. But those are, although we real fish, I mean, we like to call it real fish, fish coming from the real ecosystem, but still is a control experiment in aquaria. Right? So the, the, the natural question is what happened, or, or, you know, when this heat wave or increasing temperature uh, eat on fish 
in, in the real ecosystem, in the GBR in this case. Th there is a lot of study done on coral, of course, of the bleaching and so forth, we know that. But what happened to, and also we know that there is an impact of fish because of the coral, secondary uh, indirect impact, because if you kill all the coral, this fish that live on coral, of course, they lose the, uh, their habitat. But the question is, what temperature does in, uh, in the field when this is coming in a way or heat wave on fish population? And that's are the results. So first of all, the fish, they do respond to the heat wave and they do respond strongly in terms of uh, transcriptional changes in the liver, similar to what we see also in the aquaria, but yet different. But the most important result of this, and I think that we all need to think about this, is that you can see here, so they basically uh, different species of fish, they react in a way, way different way to this heat wave. So some more fish, like the denser fish, tend to be more resilient, and some, like the apagones, they tend to be more sensitive to this. So meaning that even if the heat wave is short in time, uh, but if it comes frequently, like the increasing frequency, you can actually shift directly fish population in the food ecosystem. So that is, you know, is something that we have to start to think about it. That's uh, not all the uh, marine life, the response, even fish or, or the fish, they respond the same way uh, uh, to a real event like the 2016 heat wave. So now to conclude almost my talk, uh, so I hope that you like the story I was telling you, but you know, you probably realize that during this story, this exercise, we generate a lot of uh, uh, resources because we use genomics, so we sequence the genome, the transcriptome, the epigenome, and of course we publish only a small proportion of this. So we like to share this to, with the community. So for example, here are all the fish uh, that we, so far we sequenced the genome. So the only published one is Epercola, Nemo, probably familiar a few years ago, the Nemo paper. But also we have chromosome scale uh, genome of Melanopus, Epoli, uh, Bicintus. And now here in Okinawa, we are actually, while speaking, we are sequencing these two species, local Okinawa. But also, in terms of this generation of resources, we shift in also to look more important or commercially important species. Uh, that is actually Roger project when it's coming here in Okinawa. So here in Okinawa, the uh, Malabar grouper is very important, economically uh, and historically, culturally. And um, we are lucky enough to collaborate with the uh, prefecture of sea farming, the, with the seeding grouper, Malabar grouper. And now we are in the process to sequence the genome. Again, that is Roger main, one of the main projects and also to put through the grouper to the same type of treatment I show you to with the denser fish, for example. Just to, because, you know, I think that's okay. We show that in, in pretty fish, but also let's look at more important or commercially important species, especially locally here in Okinawa. So uh, just to give an example how these resources they look like, this is the Nemo genome. So I don't go in detail how we sequence this. You can ask me, it's published, but, you know, could be boring. Uh, so, but Nemo has 26,000 gene. We bin that in chromosome, so that is the chromosome of Nemo, 24 chromosome. Uh, so basically, this is a chromosome scale uh, genome. And here is the comparison of some of our genome on the top right, uh, the Epoli, Nemo, and the cinnamon clownfish, compared to other genome that have been sequenced at chromosome level, including zebrafish here, which is a model organism. And you can see here that for those people that understand genomics, so on the top right, meaning that if your dot is in the top right, meaning that your genome is more complete and assembled than other. So our genomes are very, very assembled, very, very complete. So it can be very useful for all sorts of uh, question, developmental or, or even for design primer or, or so forth. So we share this with the community, that's the website, that's where you can download for free or, or even search your favorite gene. Uh, right now there is only the Nemo genome because it's the only one published, but we will upload all the genome, including the grouper in, in this website, which are transferred now in Okinawa. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, sorry if I move around, but I cannot sit down for, uh, uh, to give a talk. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, 
Um, we already have two questions and then there's a few more. If you have any questions, just write them. So the first question is, let me see what happens if I push this. Uh, okay, good, sorry. Um, in your first experiment, developmental and transgenerational, how gradually did you increase the temperature? Sorry if I missed this. Okay, so, uh, then, sorry, I just, can you see the presentation still? Yep. Okay, so in the first experiment, I gradually, well, the first experiment we did, if you mean this one, we just increased, uh, not gradually, so we just took the fish uh, and we put it to uh, plus 1.5 or three degrees from the same clouds, right? These are all brother and sister, we split it and we put it in tanks where the temperature is only 1.5 more than the average, or tanks that is uh, three degrees more than the average Celsius. Gradually, that is the other experiment we did later on, is the step treatment. Here, you can see here where there is the arrow. So those now is gradually because we, through generation, the first generation experience only moderate 1.5 degrees Celsius, that is mid-century prediction. So, in say in 30 years or so, or 40 years. And then the, the next generation of those, we drop it in three degrees. So that is a gra gradual increase in temperature. And the, the three degree will be the end of the century. So I hope this answered your question. Yeah, hopefully too, otherwise I can ask again. So the next question is, what is the maximum temperature that this species experiences across the geographic range? And do your experiments represent a novel temperature for all the, uh, for the overall species or for the local GBR populations? Uh, okay, so uh, the, the maximum temperature that strongly depend now on the heat wave, right? How moderate the heat wave are or uh, acute heat wave are. But uh, I think that the, the, to answer the question is up to four to five degrees Celsius. We know that as we increase the temperature in aquaria or this species, the epoly or others, uh, a little bit too high, then we die, or they will not reproduce. Mm. So, uh, of course, fish, as we show with the methylome and the trascritome, uh, is very important where you're coming from. If you're coming from an area like Heron Island, where naturally you experience a change in temperature during season, even slightly, two degrees, uh, that does do a big effect, or it has a big implication of how the fish responds to increasing temperature compared to the Palm Island. For example, that is not a global observation. So that is done in the GBR. So we are doing similar experiment here in Okinawa with Oshilaris, where Okinawa, the temperature or the water is a little bit lower in average than the GBR. So we don't have the data yet, but uh, so it will be interesting to see if the same species here in Okinawa, which are adapted to a more variable temperature than the GBR, they would respond the same. So even very far geographical location and different type of ecosystem. Yeah. Okay, so next question from who? Beirut Puchol, Puyol. Um, first he or she thanks you for the fantastic talk. Okay. And um, I agree. And about the long-term transgeneration experiment, did you look into the time it would take for those that changed after many generations of exposure to come back to normal? We did, yes. So uh, we, we did look into that. So that was a very complicated experiment because the picture I show is only a snapshot of the entire big experiment. So we look into that, but uh, in terms of treatment and in terms of transcriptomics, but we didn't analyze that part of the data yet. So, you know, it's, there are a lot, of, a lot of treatment and a lot of uh, data. So you, you have to stay tuned and maybe in the future we'll, we'll okay. let you know. Another anonymous question. The genes that were differentially methylated in the step group, were they the same that you found differentially expressed in the previous experiment? Uh, there, there, yes and no. There, there is an overlap of some genes that tend to be always uh, differentially expressed when you stress with the temperature. But for me, the cool thing is that uh, uh, also there was a lot of genes or pathway or gene, uh, say pathway group of genes that fit into a certain specific pathway that are different. So that is uh, 
For me, it's a nice example of how nature works and it's very plastic. So you want to reach a point, in this case is perform your fitness or better perform your fitness in a new environment. And there is not only one way how you can get there. So genomically. So I think that that is, uh, is very nice. So, and that's a cool, cool help the resilience of animal, not only fish, that this redundancy of, uh, of how you can get to the same point, uh, but slightly different way. But you know, say that there are few genes, a few pathway, like blood pressure, increasing blood pressure and so forth, that seem to be very important for this acclimation to uh, temperature, higher temperature. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but... uh, a question from Ira. Great talk, thanks. How applicable do you think your findings of transgener transgenerational plasticity are to other species slash taxa? Uh, this, well, uh, okay, so in fish, we did several experiments in different species. I didn't have time to present here, and you know, they still tend to acclimate to, to higher temperature. Uh, different taxa, maybe I am probably talking about coral. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I know that you know you guys doing experiment there on transgeneration and coral, uh, but it's a different thing, right? So because, uh, for example, coral is an invertebrate, and the methylation component is totally, and the methylation regulation is totally different than vertebrates. So fish are very similar to human in terms of how they regulate uh, 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 the methylation, for example, or transfer the methylation with the sperm and the eggs, and, and so forth. But how is this is general? Uh, you know, to be honest, I don't know. I tend to think that it's very general. That is the same question that, uh, you know, we submitted the, the, the paper the first time we submitted to science, we was rejected, but because of this. So they were asking us how you can generalize this. So we only try one species at the time, one species, now more species. But yeah, so we are in the process to see how general. My guess in fish could be a uh, kind of common mechanism or general mechanism of, of basically set the next generation genomes on, the, on a new type of environment. Again, back to what I was saying before, if this coming with the same gene, the same pathway, probably not, but I think that methylation is the key mechanism to transfer that information. So, um, well, a question from Damien Paris. Um, elevated temperatures can increase DNA fragmentation in sperm. Did you notice any reduction in fertility amongst heat-treated groups, no. particularly higher temperatures? Well, we know that the F3 uh, plus 3 degree, they will not, uh, they cannot breed. So yeah, the answer is yes. But we also look uh, into, uh, actually my student, Lucrezia, she's looking into now uh, the, uh, the sperm and the uh, eggs DNA fragmentation, what's going on there. So again, she's still doing her PhD, so she doesn't have the full result, but uh, so far seem to be that DNA fragmentation in the eggs it didn't, didn't change with the control or the quality of the DNA in general or the transcriptomics or the non-coding RNA we look into also, uh, if that can change the uh, macro RNA repertoire, uh, the temperature synthesis, uh, the expression change, but in terms of integrity, no. Mm. So you have looked at fertility-related fertility genes? Uh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay, are there any other questions? Time doesn't look like it. So thank you, Tim, for an awesome talk. It was very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you yeah. for inviting me, guys. And it was a pleasure. And thank you, everyone, to join to see the Zoom seminar. And again, my apologies for walking around, so <laughs> I cannot just stay still. So thank you again to everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you.